My name's David Fuller, I'm a journalist, and I've recently started teaching men's work. And this is a bit of a story about how I got into men's work, what I got out of it, and it's about masculinity, and it's about my relationship with my father. It's a very personal story, but I hope that it's also in some way universal. Um, when I've told it to people in the past, it sort of, yeah, it, it seems to connect with something quite deep in the experience of having a father and maybe not getting on so well with your father and then trying to rebuild that, that, that relationship in, in the later years of your life. So we're going to pull back and start this story um, back in 2011 in Libya. I used to be a uh, foreign producer with Channel 4 News. Uh, Tripoli was falling. Gaddafi was on the run. We came into Tripoli just as Gaddafi's regime was crumbling. This is centre of Tripoli just as everything's going completely mental. So yeah, then, so shortly after that we got to Gaddafi's tent. This is the burnt out Gaddafi's tent in the centre of Tripoli. And around us all of these guns are going off, people firing into the air. It's just this incredible moment. Well, there's a few times in my journalistic career where I felt I'm in the middle of history. This is just an extraordinary place, an extraordinary experience. And we had a satellite phone and I thought, I really want to share this. So I called my parents, I called my mum and she answered the phone and I said, listen to, listen to this. <laughs> Just crazy, crazy moment, guns going off everywhere. And she started crying. And I said, OK, it's not that, not that moving. I mean, um, I'm not in danger. Um, and she then said, I'm at the hospital. Uh, I'm with your dad. He's just been diagnosed with stomach cancer. And we don't know much, but we know that stomach cancer is, is a diagnosis of stomach cancer usually means it's pretty advanced. And we think it's pretty bad. And he, he was young, he was fit, he'd just been on a cycling holiday the, literally just the week before. Um, and so it's completely unexpected, completely out of the blue. And I knew it wasn't good, I started crying as well on the phone and my bosses at Channel 4 News thankfully just put me on a plane straight back to, to the UK. And so as we're in the plane going back to the UK, I'm just going to take a little digression and fill in the gaps. Because um, growing up, I didn't get on well with my father at all. We always fought, and we still didn't get on even in 2011, just before uh, this happened. Um, and I, to be honest, I was, I was a bit of a little shit to him growing up. Um, I used to kind of take the, the piss out of him. I used to, there was a sort of conspiracy with my mother against him. Um, and I was, I... I never worked this out, worked out why for a long time, but I was really nasty to him, and I'd, I'd push him, I'd push him, I'd push him. And I, I remember one time I pushed him so much that he grabbed me by my throat and held me up against a wall. And it didn't, it didn't sort of dawn on me until later, and there was kind of a real sense of euphoria when, I got, when that happened as well. And it, it never dawned on me until later why that had happened. It took me quite a long time to work it out. Um, and a lot of it was through the kind of the men's work and the inner work that I'd done after that that I sort of started to make sense of it. Um, so my parents were very left-wing, very idealistic. My childhood was like CND marchers, um, delivering leaflets for the Labour Party. They were very rebellious as well, and naturism. <laughs> <laughs> now, for about the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be speaking with a picture of my naked father behind me, but um, <laughs> it's what he would have wanted. Um, so my father was very much a kind of uh, new man. He wanted to be very different from the male role models that he had, and he wanted to, to kind of yeah, be non-competitive and be, uh, be so someone different from, from his father and, and what he'd seen growing up. Um, very non-competitive. I can remember when we, would play, when we played football, me and my brother, he'd say, why do you have to have a goal? Why can't you just pass it to each other? <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a while to... But underneath, he was, he was really opinionated. He was really stubborn. He always thought he was right. Very different from me. <laughs> as, um, 
everyone who knows me will realise. Um, and he could also get really, really angry um, and want his own way. And I think that's what I was doing when I pushed him, just sort of pushing that point, like to say, I know that that's not, that, that that's not authentic, that kind of non-competitive edge. There's something more there. And I pushed him until he, until he snapped, until I found it. And my mum told me later on that just that moment really traumatised him. Like he really, it took him a long time to get over that, that, that I pushed him to that point, that he grabbed me and that he realised that he had that in him. Um, and it took, it took a, lot, a lot of sort of transformational work after that where I started to really unpack the, the anger that I had towards my father and to really kind of understand it and, and recognise that all the things that I disliked in him, I, I had it. I had all of those things in myself and was really able to kind of understand the, the shadow of what, what I was pushing out in him was something that I also had. Because my, my experience of men's work is that, so I can speak for myself as a man, I, I, I have those, those edges, I have that aggression, I have that wanting to be right, I have that wanting to dominate, I have all of these things that can come out. And my experience is, it's only through fully recognising those and integrating them that I've become more whole as a man. To, to do what you could call the shadow work of really kind of looking at myself really deeply and then taking that anger, taking that aggression and using it, integrating it into the personality and then becoming sort of more, more present, more powerful. It becomes, I think, once integrated, a form of sort of personal power and becomes a kind of fuel for, certainly has become a kind of fuel for my life. And over probably since about 2006, when I first started doing workshops and starting doing this work, this sort of inner work from a place of crisis in myself, um, that I started to really kind of integrate some of these things. Um, and on some level, I started to heal at least some of the relationship with him in myself. Although at this point, we hadn't kind of healed it in the, in the outside world. So plane's now about to land in, in the UK. Um, <laughs> And I go straight down to Southampton to see my dad in the hospital. And he's outside in the garden with my mum and a family friend. And I just go up to him and I embrace him. And for my friend, after a few minutes, my friend takes this picture, which is one of the most precious uh, things I have in my life, I think. Um, the hug probably lasted for about 10 minutes. It might have been even more. It sort of time stopped. And um, my friend realized at some point that he was in the presence of something special and got his phone out and took this picture. And something, something I think very profound happened in that moment. Some kind of healing happened. And I've had a few friends who've looked at this. A friend of mine touched it up and um, has turned it into a picture I have on my wall at home. And there's something about the way he's kind of collapsing into me and I'm holding him that's a kind of a transfer of some kind of, I don't know, as a child taking something and, and, and taking it from my father. That, that from what then happened, I, I feel that that's what happened in that moment. Um, and, and I think what happened here catalyzed a lot of, of what happened next. Um, because shortly after that, he got the diagnosis and he was diagnosed with three months to live. Um, and that makes, <laughs> makes things real, obviously. Um, and I, I then wrote him a letter and I said, I said, look, I've been doing all of this work, I've done all these workshops and I get these reflections from people in these workshops where people say, they talk about my authenticity or they talk about my honesty or, and I realise these are your qualities. And I realised that I got them from you, and I've never been able to admit that to you. I've never been able to, to recognise all the good that I got from you. And he was very touched by that letter. And then I thought, well, this is, he's going to be dead in three months. Why doesn't everyone, I don't want to hear it as funeral stuff that people should have said to him before. So I then got in touch with all of his friends, all of the family, everyone that he used to work with, as many people as I could, and said, he's going to be dead in three months. I want, to I want you to, what you might want to say at the funeral, I want you to say it now and send it to him. And so over the next three months, as he was becoming more and more ill, lying in bed, my mum was reading these to him. And all of this amazing stuff started coming in from former friends, work colleagues, family.
So he was an arts officer for the council and created the Southampton Film Festival. Saved the Theatre Royal in Winchester. Created the street parties in the road. And my father's like, core wound was that he really didn't think he'd achieve very much in his life. He, he had a, a real down on himself and felt that he'd been a failure. He'd never really uh, amounted to much. And this, this had really eaten away at him. Um, and then somehow in the last three months of his life, some of that changed, some of that shifted just from the weight of all this stuff coming in. Um, and the, the sheer love and outpouring of, of, of stuff that came in. And I, I, I'm sure that part of that was catalyzed by that one moment and that one healing that I was able to do and then to be there for him and then to produce. I turned, um, yeah, I'm sure it was catalyzed by this, by this moment. Um, and then I, I made a, I, I took all of those and made it into a book that I gave to him for his, for his birthday, sort of about three weeks before he died. Because um, there was also, when, when things like this happen, there's, there's a Jordan Peterson quote um, where he talks about be the person to rely on in a funeral. It's hard enough in a funeral, but it can be absolute hell if you haven't dealt with your family stuff. And I really feel, because all sorts of stuff came in. Some people are in denial. Some people are in, don't want to know. I mean, other members of my family just wanted it to go away. They weren't ready for, I feel that I, I was able to be there because of the work that I'd done. Um, and... Yeah, it, it turned into a really beautiful experience rather than being absolute hell. Um, even though we were all there when he died, we, we were holding hands around his bed when he died and it was, it was very, yeah, it was, it was one of the most, it, I now look back on it as one of the most precious moments of my life. Um, and it's a, it's, a wonder, <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful story and it's often, I told this sort of over the last few years and this is normally where it ends and um, it's, but it's not where it ends. Um, because as someone who had, I believed my father's image of himself. Like I, I treated him as this failure growing up. I realized that I'd internalized the story that he had and treated him the same way he kind of treated himself. And then to have all of this come in at the age of 36 to realize by the time he was my age, he'd opened an art center, he'd saved a theater, he'd created the Southampton Film Festival, he'd had three kids. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> This guy I thought was a failure had achieved far more at, at that stage than I had. And there's also something that, in my experience, when your father goes as a man, that's, there's something archetypal. Even though I didn't get on that well with my father, there's something there that's missing, this sort of archetypal grounding point. And I really found that I had to go on a journey of myself over the next sort of six months to really find my path and find what I needed to do. And it, was, it then became like the hardest period of my life. Um, like I had some real ups and downs over the last six years just really trying to get my shit together and decide what it was that I was meant to be doing with my life and what I was meant to be bringing into the world. Um, yeah, it was pretty hard. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's only in the last year I feel that I've really started to come out of that and realise what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And it's sort of, it's leading men's work using my journalistic skills to tell the stories of this kind of transformational work and then to lead the work because you can only, you can't, you can't show someone a film and give them a transformational experience, you've got to give the transformational experience as well. And this is the work that I'm most passionate about and this is what I found the most helpful in my, in my personal journey. Um, and we consciously, in our workshops, we consciously bring in support of the father. It's a very kind of emotional piece for a lot of men to to feel that, to, to, to model some, uh, some healthy father energy in that workshop space. And we had a guy, a father in our last workshop, who said he, he really wanted to go away and give that to his son. So I, you know, as I was writing this yesterday, I kind of, I wish that my father had had some of this. And maybe the relationship that I had with him would have been a bit different. Um, but he did the best he could, and I'm really grateful for that. And... I just want to, yeah, honour him by raising a toast to Michael. Oh. To Michael. Oh. To Michael. Oh. <laughs>